Okay, we can start. Okay, um, hi and welcome everyone to this webinar today, uh, which is uh, organized by EEB together with EIA and ECOS, uh, where we will be discussing the recently uh, published proposal for a reviewed uh, FGAS regulation. Um, the FGAS regulation is an important uh, climate file that is perhaps uh, a little bit off the main stage, um, but we're hoping today to put the spotlight on it. Um, with us uh, today, we have uh, Bente Tronholm Schwartz from DG Klima, who will be uh, presenting um, the content of the proposal. Uh, we also have David Sabadin from EEB and Claire Perry from EIA, uh, who will give their uh, reactions from the NGO uh, perspective. And uh, last but not least, we have Francesco Mastrapasca from the EPTA group and Ascold, who will be representing the industry perspective today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Bente tranholm Schwartz from DigiClima. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to reach so many people with our uh, news about uh, the proposal. I will uh, start to, to share my screen because I made a small uh, presentation. So I'll just check that this is in the background. It is. Um, so share screen. And there it is. So I hope you can all see it now. Yes. You can see it, good. I am very happy oh, to no. uh, be here. Oh, no, no, no. Um, We cannot hear you, Bente. I'm afraid I'll have to do it without presentation. I wasn't aware that uh, I used an old presentation uh, form and there there is uh, a recording on it and I don't know how to get it off, but uh, I can also do this um, simply uh, by, by talking to you because it's not uh, that complex. So uh, why have we proposed a new uh, FGAS regulation uh, right now? That is of course because the commission committed itself to the European Green Deal, which uh, in terms of climate uh, has put two very ambitious uh, targets, one in 2030, which is to uh, reduce emissions by minus 55% uh, compared to uh, 1990. And that is uh, going up from 40% uh, in the previous 2030 target we, ha we had. So that is uh, a very ambitious uh, approach that we have uh, put forward there. And we have also uh, committed ourselves to become climate neutral. In, in 2050. And when the commission put forward uh, these targets, which have been endorsed uh, by the EU institutions, we also said that we would turn every stone we had in terms of EU policies to make sure that they all are walking the talk, that they are contributing what they need to do in order for us to, to reach these very ambitious targets. So this FGAS proposal is um, just, I would say, coming after many of the other proposals that the commission uh, has already put on the table and is, you can say, part of that big fifth, Fit for 55 uh, exercise that uh, we are doing right now. The main objectives for the FCAS policy has always been to 
prevent emissions uh, from F gases where it was technically and economically feasible. And um, this will, of course, if we can reduce more emissions, we can contribute more to, to these new targets uh, we have. But we also now have a new, uh, I would say, main objective with the FGAS regulation. And that is to ensure full compliance with the Montreal Protocol. Uh, with the current regulation, we had the objective to facilitate that a global agreement would be agreed under the Montreal Protocol. And uh, we, together with other uh, nations in the world, succeeded in achieving that objective. So now this, this situation has changed. And now, of course, we need to ensure that we can comply with it fully. Uh, we are also aiming at promoting green growth with what we do to promote innovation and to lead by example, to show what is possible so that other uh, countries around the world can uh, see how it is feasible to take similar ambitious approaches around the world. Um, we first, as we always do in the commission, uh, made an evaluation of the current regulation to see what works and what doesn't work. And um, that evaluation showed that in general, the current regulation actually works very well in terms of what it was expected to do. So it is delivering uh, emission reductions as we were more or less hoping. It's falling a little bit short of what we had estimated, but it is delivering a very big contribution uh, in the 2030 uh, perspective already. But it was designed to contribute to our minus 40% target in 2030 and an 80 to 85% reduction target in 2050. So in this new context with the European Green Deal, it is not enough uh, to just uh, achieve what we were hoping to achieve in 2014 when we adopted uh, the current regulation. So we, it, it was clear we had to review the regulation to, to raise ambition, but there were also other issues that we identified in, in our evaluation, namely that with our current uh, regulation, the way it was structured, we would actually not be able to fully safeguard uh, compliance with the Montreal Protocol in the longer term. Uh, so there would be a need to streamline uh, the FGAS regulation so that we could ensure this uh, Montreal Protocol compliance. And uh, it was also clear that there would be an opportunity to make the rules in a different way so that they are easier to enforce and so that it is also clearer what needs to be enforced and also uh, to better ensure that we have dissuasive uh, penalties. It was also identified that we could have a better monitoring and a more kind of streamlined reporting. And that as it's always the case when you have legislation, you find out that there are some issues uh, that are not as clear as you thought they were when you, you wrote the regulation. So uh, the many questions we have received uh, over the years have also resulted in a number of um, clarifications. So in general, we had these five review objectives. So more ambition, streamlined with the Montreal Protocol, better implementation and enforcement, improve monitoring and reporting, and ensure better coherence and uh, make some clarifications. So we had these five review objectives when we started making the new regulation. And for each objective, we identified measures that could deliver each of those review objectives. And we came up with a very, very long list of different, you can say small measures that would all somehow target one of these uh, review objectives. And then we, um, decided to arrange them after how much we thought they would cost. Um, so we made three options. 
where we were grouping these measures. And in a simplified way, you can say option one had the fewest amount of, of uh, options. And then option two had, had more options and in, generally, in general included all the options, all the measures that were in option one. And in option three, you basically had all the measures we could think of, no matter how uh, expensive they, they would be. And then we analyzed what would um, the impacts then be in terms of cost and benefits of these three packages. And um, the package we chose uh, when it comes to aligning with the climate ambition uh, is increasing the steepness of the phase down that we have for, for ACFCs. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to compare um, the steepness of the phase down with the starting point we had in 2015 because we have changed the scope uh, on the way, but we have tried to make, I would say, an approximation of uh, what it means by taking into account this change in scope. And basically, uh, in 2030, we will uh, reduce the amount of HFCs that, are, that can be placed on the market compared to what was placed on the market in 2015 by almost 95% in CO2 equivalent, and in 2050, it will be reduced uh, by almost 98%. Uh, so this is a very significant reduce in the use of uh, new HFCs uh, in, in the EU that, that we are proposing here. We have also proposed some new uh, placing on the market and use uh, prohibitions. Uh, they are mostly in Annex four uh, of the uh, the new proposal. There, I, I will highlight that we are proposing to uh, request that for placing switch gear on the market, uh, you can only use a substance with a DWP of uh, less than ten. Uh, the, depending on what type of switch gear this prohibition will uh, come into force between 2026 and, and 2030. Uh, if it is not feasible to go down to a substance with a DWP of 10, you will have the possibility to, you, to try to stay under a DWP of 2000. And if that is also not feasible, then you can go up to using uh, I mean, in, in practice, it would probably be using SF6 as, as you do today. And uh, companies would have to uh, keep records of the reasons why it was considered not to be technically feasible to use either 10 or 2000, um, depending on how, how far they, they need to, to go up. Also in the field of air conditioning and heat pumps, we are uh, moving the target a bit we are, for some heat pumps, uh, requesting that they can only use a, a substance with a DWP below 150. And for larger split air conditioning and heat pumps, they can go up to a DWP of 750. Then we have also found, found some new areas uh, where uh, we felt there was a need to ensure that we are simply not using uh, that type of equipment with uh, HFCs uh, in the EU, and that concerns personal care products and skin cooling equipment, uh, because it is possible to care for yourself without uh, using uh, equipment and uh, products that are uh, containing HFCs. And then um, we are also removing an exemption we had to use um, to allow the use of uh, HFCs above 2,500 in smaller refrigeration systems. And we are also prohibiting the use of desflurane in inhalation uh, anesthetics. So we have put in some more prohibitions where we are sure that it is possible to simply, uh, I would say, get away from using highly warming uh, F-gases.
our proposal uh, where we are targeting the streamlining of the uh, with the Montreal Protocol uh, is the, the most important thing there is that we are removing certain exemptions that we have currently to the phase down in, in the regulation. And that notably concerns the uh, asthma sprays, the meter dose inhalers that will no longer be exempted uh, from the phase down. And there are also some thresholds that uh, have been changed. Then we are also putting in a separate production phase down and we are also uh, banning uh, trade with, with non-parties uh, in order to, to streamline but that is not expected to, I would say, reduce um, emissions uh, compared to what we have today. Um, on the, the, the measures that are intended to improve the implementation and enforcement, um, we have made much more specific provisions for customs authorities and for surveillance authorities. Uh, we are introducing a quota price uh, and some specific requirements for new entrants who are asking for quota uh, from the reserve. We are ensuring that whistleblowers can be protected if they are um, informing us about illegal trade and that there are some minimum requirements for the penalties that member states must establish. And then we are also uh, changing the timing of when uh, HFCs, uh, when, when you must have quota, when you place HFCs on the market. And currently this is an annual exercise. So you can, for instance, in May, you can import uh, HFCs without sufficient quota and say, I'm going to make sure that I will have the quota later on, or I'm going to re-export it. So at the end of the year, I will not need the, the quota. That's how it works currently, but it makes it more difficult um, to, to stop illegal uh, imports in the cases where they are then not doing what they are saying they intended to do. So we have changed the timing. So we are now saying, you must have sufficient quota at the point in time when you release for free circulation. And member states are being asked to designate specialized uh, customs officers to handle release for free circulation uh, on HFCs so that it is not going into some, uh, I would say smaller customs offices where they may not uh, be so much aware about our rules and the obligations they they have uh, in in this context. Um, so this this will be, I would say, a totally different ball game. And what is also really going to change the the control is that we will be coupling our licensing system with this uh, single window environment for customs, which will imply that whenever somebody is making a customs declaration and declaring that they are going to release HFC uh, for free circulation, that information will go directly into our licensing system. And there it will be checked if that is okay or not. And if it is okay, a message will go back to the customs saying, yes, you can release for free circulation. If it's not okay, a message will go to the customs authorities. You cannot allow this to be released for free circulation. So that will greatly facilitate the work for customs authorities that they are basically told exactly what they have to do and they don't have to figure it out themselves. They don't have to go into a different system as it is currently and open and see is there a license or not. It will all be automatic in the future. And on top of it, we will be storing all the data uh, in our system, in the licensing system, which is combined with our reporting system. So we can then also uh, better double check with the reporting that we get at the end of the year that what is being released for free circulation is also uh, being reported. 
so in that sense, uh, we think the control with this new proposal will be uh, much, much better. And the administrative burden involved uh, will actually not be so high in the sense that the customs will, will get this automatic uh, message. Uh, it will, of course, be a little bit difficult to establish it. But, um, but when that's done, then we hope that uh, it will work extremely well. Then in order to also ensure that we can actually move to the natural refrigerants and the low GWP refrigerants, we are um, proposing to expand the certification and training schemes um, that are currently covering uh, F gases to also cover uh, energy efficiency and uh, skills on F gas alternatives. Uh, and this is to, I would say, address the barrier that, that we may not have a sufficient amount of uh, trained personnel to install all the heat pumps that we want uh, very soon uh, in the EU. Um, so maybe I'll just quickly uh, say a little bit about the impacts. Um, I mean, with, the, with all the current measures that, are, that we have in the regulation that we are keeping, we are already reducing emissions quite significantly in the EU. But with these new additional measures, we will, in addition, reduce uh, up to 310 million tons of CO2 equivalent until 2050. And that is more or less comparable with uh, the annual emissions in Spain in 2019. So it is, um, it is going to be a significant uh, contribution. Overall, it will not be costly. It will actually uh, generate cost savings. Uh, we have calculated that the average from 2024 to 2036 um, will be minus 36 euros per ton of uh, CO2 equivalent. There are, however, sectors that will have positive and higher uh, cost uh, than, than this um, cost saving uh, on average. Uh, so there will be cost up to 336 euros in some, I would say, marginal sectors. But that is still less than what has been estimated um, in the modeling done in the, the commission on uh, what is needed for uh, achieving net climate neutrality in, in 2050. So it is still within the range that is um, is appropriate. There will also be some slightly, you know, general economic effects due to innovation, uh, but it is not. Uh, it is not. Yeah, it's not a lot. Let's put it like that. Um, I think I will will stop here and um, give the floor back. And and sorry about the the presentation. I'll have to find out how I take away the sound. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Bente. I think uh, you did a great job, uh, even without the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, so next, we are going to hear from um, the remaining uh, panelists. Uh, I just want to um, tell the audience, I see uh, some of you have already found it, but we do have a Q&A uh, chat function where you can submit uh, questions to any of the panelists. And um, if you do so, I ask that you give your name and your affiliation. And um, then after uh, everyone has spoken, we will take up some of the questions. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Bente. And I would now like to give the floor to Davide Sabadin, who is the Senior Policy Officer at EEP. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carolina. Good morning, everyone. And. Um, I should be uh, sharing my screen now. Should be working, hope so. Okay, just give me a sign if it's working. Is it? Okay. 
Um, so good morning, everyone. I am um, I'm following the Afgas relation for the EB, and I've been following this file since twelve uh, was well, since um, uh, two thousand thirteen uh, from Italy. Back then, I was working from the Gambian one of our members, and uh, while now I'm following for it for the EB, which is the largest network of environmental citizens organization. And uh, and with more one hundred seven more than um, one hundred seven uh, seventy members in thirty five countries, uh, dealing with all sorts of environmental impacts, not only climate of course, but also chemicals and um, the biodiversity concern. So the overall assessment of our, of this uh, revision, and uh, I'll start with this slide. I mean, although I, I will not be touching on some key points that I know will be touched uh, uh, on. Uh, by 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 my colleague Claire um, Claire Perry from the EIA because uh, so just to not to overlap and so I will not be dealing with bans and the the phase down issues or or the illegal trade but um, I'll I'll deal with the, with the rest and uh, I'll start saying that we welcome very much the the fact that this this uh, regulation aligns with the phase uh, the phase down with uh, the target. The EU climate target for 2030 and 2050, which is uh, which is yeah uh, very positive. Uh, and although some people say say, say it's, it's too too strict, but we we do, we don't see how a climate file could not align with the climate targets. So it's really uh, something that we want. And um, also the inclusion of the M MDIs and other categories in the portal systems that makes it more, well, as as Penta said, uh, uh, aligned with the with the Montreal Protocol. And um, we also praise the intention of uh, strengthening the market surveillance uh, and to harmonize administrative sanctions. Uh, though I think we, there's room for improvement for there, and uh, and I'll deal a bit later uh, with this. And um, but overall, we call for more ambition and urgent action, especially in the trading uh, uh, sector. Uh, we stress also the fact that we have witnessed along these years. Uh, in the implementation phase, lack of resources uh, for the member states specifically, and in different stakeholders are, that are, they have to implement the relation. And so we, can, we think we can improve uh, the implementation of this new revision, uh, but we need more resources. And this could come from, for instance, from a different quarter location system. And then we lament the absence of DN, DNN, do not uh, harm criteria in the assessment of alternative refrigerants. Um, sorry for the typos in, in the slide. Um, yes, we think that while we are at it, we should not just uh, skip the, the opportunity to, to stress the fact that, that alternatives should be sound from every environmental point of view. So let's start from one of the most important bottlenecks um, that is, we think, it's not really fully tackled in, 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 the, in the text, which is the one of the training. Repower EU uh, communication, and we'll see about Repower EU uh, uh, packages uh, of measures in, in May, has made it very clear that is, uh, there's an urgent need for professional installers in the heating and air conditioning uh, sector. Remarkably for heat pumps, we were called to install 10 million heat pumps in five, in five years. This is also uh, uh, recognized and, 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 uh, and discussed in the impact assessment of this regulation. And there are too few installers for these heat pumps. And uh, those who are there are not trained on all refrigerants available. And in the meantime, many of these producers are switching and changing refrigerants to, uh, compared to what they were used a few years ago. Not of this, these professionals are not really keen to have extra red tape and, and to pay for the training in the moment where they are busy 24 7 to, to cope with the demand they have, the booming demand of heat pumps. So this is really a practical issue, how, you, how we train these professionals, how we increase the amount of professionals, and how we train them on all the frequencies we need to have them trained. So we feel that in this part of the regulation, there's a general lack of sense of urgency around this training. If we're looking at both of the climate targets, but even more, the Repower EU objectives, but, I mean, we're nowhere near the, the urgency that we need there to, to train, train out of, uh, these, uh, these professionals. So the relevant, the relevant details in the regulation are left for, for later, the what and how they will be included in the implementing acts. This is not 100% clear to us. This is a question for, for the commission. 
If not, natural refrigerants are there included for both training and certification, only training, or it's not, which wasn't really, it's not very clear to, to, to us at least. And we called, uh, to be honest, we call on the, the parliament, the council to further strengthen this, uh, strengthen this training uh, provisions. For instance, by setting national plans obligations, uh, not only obligation of training, but obligation to having a plan with clear KPIs. For instance, it could be like 50% of trained professionals installed this by 2025. This is of course something to, to, to see with the, the professional uh, organizations like ARIA and others. But just to say, we should need to have KPIs, clear KPIs, in order that we make sure that by 2030, everyone is on, on some board and everyone is able, is able, to, able to install the, the, the greenest technology post that, that we have available. Uh, parallel to that, it could be also urgent EU level training measures uh, that could apply. There's, oh, there are already some uh, live products that are being working on this. It could be maybe, there could be maybe a source of inspiration. And then again, there's the issue of the resources, as I was saying before. The three euro quarter fee is expected to, to, to kind of get, get rid of uh, straw men and free riders. That's all welcome for sure. But it expected, if I read correctly, it's expected to provide some 100, 120 million euros the first year. And, and then this, this, this amount will be decreasing in, in the following years. This is probably too little a sum to achieve the full implementation of the regulation, as I said before, because um, we also read in the in the impact assessment that, that this quarter fee would to be uh, were to, to to raise, and there wouldn't be um, sensible differences for the consumers. And um, and knowing that many member states showed lack of assessment for market surveillance, uh, particularly. This is not, and this is not going to change as we hear. We think that a different system of allocation of quota that generates higher revenues should be in place. Uh, what could we use these revenues for? Well, for instance, we could be using the revenues for supporting member states in the effort to incentivize greener solutions, with very low GWP. Uh, to my understanding, very few uh, member states, from the top of my mind, I think maybe Germany or, and out of the EU, maybe UK had tried to make a difference between the, the kind of uh, refrigerants you might have, uh, if you, you have in your, your the technology you're going to install when it comes to subsidies. Might be wrong here, but I mean, this is really the exception, not the rule in Europe. It would be good if it would, it would become the rule that you, you get a, a higher incentive if this is, uh, this is um, Use if your technology is using a very low GWP, and then it could be supporting uh, emergency and mid-term training for existing uh, workforce and future workforce, and then again it could be supporting member states' authority in the market surveillance, and like customs but also police controls, and then promote awareness raising campaigns at European level or the national level for the consumers that which are not really aware of the problem, especially when they, they buy like air conditioning they just they don't. Mostly, most of the time, they don't care how where the, the refrigerants end uh, up. The other point, as I was, was mentioning, is, is the fact that there's, uh, some of the alternatives in the market uh, uh, can pose uh, chemical harm. Of course, it is still object of debate, but it's more and more evidence in the scientific community that there might be a release of PFAS, so-called forever chemicals, from some of the uh, um, refrigerants that are there in the market are upcoming in the market or they're growing strong in the market. So we think that a clear link with the reach should be there and it's a way that is automatically included that at the very least it's automatically included that when the reach will define these substances, if which will define the substances as harmful, they will be automatically excluded from, from the authorities. But better than that, we should be having the, 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 the prevention principle there. And so make sure that every time it is possible you, you, that consumers would switch from HFCs to a safer alternative, which is both safe for climate and safe for, 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 for the environment, for, for chemical points of view. That would be a double safety that we have there. So it's kind of a double criteria to apply. And uh, also, not only for, for environmental reasons, but also because investing in potential, potentially harmful uh, refrigerants, sorry, creates uncertainty, both on the producer sides 
and the consumer side. This is a, they, they might go for technology and production line, and then maybe in ten years cannot be uh, continued because uh, because the the gas is the, is the, is defined as harmful, and and the users has bought a, a, a technology that has to last twenty years, and maybe in a few years it will be find it will find himself or herself in the, in a position to to have to ditch it because the gas is no longer available. So this is why we should uh, avoid this as much as possible. And then again, uh, some couple of minor issues, maybe. Um, there's alongside, I mean, several member states, there's basically no debate about this big climate fire. And uh, there's, no, there's no awareness of the gas problems in, in, in citizenship and um, in the citizens, sorry. And, uh, and so we think that alongside the consultation forum at the European level, uh, there should, it should be ensured that there are such forums or anyway uh, participation process at national level and nothing is mentioned in, in the regulation. Um, because these this are very useful to update institutions on the state of the art of the technologies. Um, some member states don't have the capacity and, and the resources to go to technical affairs or just reach out to the, every, every, every company in, 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 the, in, in, the, in, the, in the territory. And it can also be useful for updating and implementation. Uh, about, especially about the problems that, that, that stakeholders um, are confronted with, and also a good place to propose solutions to better implement the regulation. And lastly, let me, let me have a word about the fact that, that the Environmental Crime Directive is being revised, and it's now mentioned in the FGAS, and maybe there could be a link there, which is uh, our legal office is just starting to work on this, so I won't go very much into uh, details here, but I just just stress that this is not a penal crime, like a, a you know, felony, felony uh, a proper crime in many member states, just uh, an administ administrative infringement. And, um, and so that there are fines there, very, very good that there are now, there's this attempt to have a harmonized fines, but also let me uh, say that, that what we're going for as EB in the Environmental Crime Directive is, is a link with, uh, with uh, uh, proportion with the turnaround of the company. It's not the same as a small company commit this crime or a very big company commit this crime because of course the fine can be relevant or not relevant depending on the, the capacity of spending okay and so in that if you are doing an infringement of this some fiscal regulation you get to have fines up to 10 percent of your turnaround and we think it should be higher for environment environmental crimes so at least 15 percent with that i conclude and i thank you for listening thank you very much um davide and uh, next on our list of speakers, we have uh, Claire Parry, who is the climate campaign leader at the uh, Environmental Investigation Agency. So please take the floor. Thank you, Carolina. I will just share my presentation. Now seems to have frozen. Perhaps uh, while we're waiting, I uh, can remind participants, please uh, feel free to send any questions um, that you have in the Q&A chat. Uh, and um, giving your name and affiliation as you do so. There will be a Q&A, um, a lot of time allowed for a Q&A session uh, after all the speakers have had their presentation. Um, we'll also have uh, Ben to give a short uh, response to, to our other panelists uh, after our last uh, speaker. And after that, there will be Q&A. Uh, how's it going, Claire, with the presentation? Um, sorry, my... Laptop seems to have completely frozen. <laughs> so, uh, it's obviously the day for technical problems. I don't know if you want to. Um, just perhaps to um, perhaps down. we'll go to uh, our uh, last speaker in the meanwhile, and maybe you can have some time to to sort out the presentation. Claire, would that be an option? Yeah, I think she froze now. Uh, I think we'll do that. We will, um, let me just see. Uh, Francesco, would you be ready to speak? Um...
Yes, I can do so. And uh, maybe you can tell me when you see my presentation. Yes, I think maybe Claire, uh, could you stop sharing the screen and I'm then Francesco can start? <laughs> I am yeah, not due to the technical issues, okay. everyone. If it's working, mm -hmm. you, do, do you prefer to speak first, Claire, or shall I? Um, because we, we were watching your presentation a while ago. Yeah, I did. Sorry, shall I just try one more time and then try one more time, Claire? Let's do if that. If it doesn't work, I'll shut down my laptop and rejoin. So sorry. Um, Over two years later, uh, with the Zoom calls, I think we have all been in this situation. So don't worry. Now, this is Francesco's. Yeah. Shall I? Yeah, shall I uh, go to my presentation? Let's, uh, let's, uh, uh, can you stop sharing screen, Francesco? We try Claire first because I think okay. it would make more sense. Okay. It would make more sense to first have the both NGOs perspectives together since they complement each other. And then uh, we'll, we'll take you last. Again, apologies for this, everyone who um, is listening. So Francesco, if you can stop sharing your screen, please. Trying to do that. I, I, I did stop sharing my presentation. You still see my presentation? No. Yes, we still, see, we still see your presentation with some time. I don't know if the technical... Um, All right, uh, Claire, can you try again to share your screen, please? There we go. Okay. Are you seeing the full screen? Now, now we're back on track. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, please, Claire, go ahead and present. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, my name's Claire Perry. I'm from the Environmental Investigation Agency. Um, I'll try and whiz through some of these early slides just to catch up on the time we've lost. Um, but just a quick word about EIA. For those that don't know us, we're a non-profit, non-governmental organization that was set up in 1984. Um, we investigate and campaign against environmental crime and abuse. Um, we have four programs of work. Our climate work um, started in the 1990s when we began investigating the illegal trade in HS in CFCs, sorry. Um, and we're one of the few NGOs that have they're very active at the Montreal uh, Protocol since that time. So we we were closely involved in the negotiations that culminated in the Kigali Amendment. Um, it doesn't seem that long ago, but we were involved in the last review of the FGAS regulation. And we have been working on implementation ever since um, in a coalition of, of NGOs, including EEB and ECOS, and you can see the, all the logos there. Um, in recent years, we've been very focused on investigating and exposing the illegal trade of HSEs in Europe. We've produced two reports, um, including one last year. Um, we also share information about um, sustainable alternative technologies to HSEs through our Cool Technologies website. So these are effectively efficient natural refrigerant uh, and non-FGAS technologies. For the FGAS regulation, we shared our demands um, in the public consultation with, in a joint NGO paper. I'm not gonna go through all these now, um, but, but basically they were along the lines of strengthening the ambition, promoting the uptake of, of HSC, HSC free alternatives and promoting compliance. And to some extent, the, the new proposal meets some of these demands. But um, unfortunately, it does fall short in several ways. 
I think the, the, the most critical area where we see this falling short is with respect to the to new placing on the market prohibitions in HFC containing equipment. Even 10 years ago, uh, or more than 10, maybe more than 10 years ago, the, the ANA F gas model that was used for the previous review showed that low GWP alternatives could achieve 100% coverage um, in the market for many sectors, but bans were not adopted um, in, in many of these subsectors and the transitions to climate friendly alternatives did not in the end keep up with the technological possibilities. The new PrEP study is showing us that most sectors are ready for bans in new installations from 2024. Um, so it's surprising to, to us that the consultants in the commission have considered so few uh, new prohibitions. Our experience, the experience is that bans promote a swift transition. Um, it's very clear to the manufacturers and the end users what they need to be doing. It helps them avoid um, being left with dead end technologies, being faced with a lack of supply of HSCs or incredibly expensive HSCs that they need to service equipment. Um, and this particularly impacts on smaller businesses that, that just don't have the resources, um, capacity and know-how to be on top of the phase-down legislation and the implications of a market-wide phase-down. And they don't have strong contracts with HFC producers to secure supply of the HFCs they need. So ultimately, the lack of bans and the reliance on the phase-down mechanism so far um, to move the market has resulted in a massive illegal trade in HFCs, and it has undermined the impact of the regulation so far. So from our perspective, the aim should be to stop using HFCs and new equipment as soon as possible, wherever possible, and to signal the market through uh, placing on the market restrictions. One of the other problems with the bans that have been included is that they're looking backwards on the existing market instead of looking forward. Heat pump equipment will explode in numbers and it will be dominated by factory sealed equipment because this is the easiest to install. And installation costs are going to increase in, in importance as the volume pushes equipment prices down. So why delay until 2027? This is meant to be the decade for climate action. Another surprising area where there's a lack of ambition is in refrigeration. Um, other than the small self-contained units and centralized system ban, the car up from the previous regulation, the proposal currently only prohibits HFCs with a GWP of 2,500 or more. And even there, it's, it's maintained the unnecessary exemptions for low temperature applications. Uh, likewise, the ban on HFCs in supermarket systems has not been strengthened. It still allows the use of uh, HFCs in the primary circuit of cascade systems. If you look on the other side of the, of the pond, California has generally restricted the use of refrigerants with a GWP of 150 or more in pretty much all commercial refrigeration from 2022, like cold storage warehouses, retail food refrigeration. They've done the same for industrial refrigeration. In Europe, there are no bans, but in, the, in California, they're banning HSEs in industrial process refrigeration equipment from 2022. So given the plethora of natural alternatives available in refrigeration, it makes no sense to us to allow continued reliance on these damaging F gases. Um, I mean, it even says in the preamble to the regulation that where suitable alternatives to the use of specific F gases are available, bans should be introduced on the placing of the market of new equipment for refrigeration, air conditioning, and fire protection. And it draws attention to the fact that if the alternatives are not available, it's possible for the Commission to authorize an exemption. So there is there's no reason not to strengthen Annex 4 considerably. And we would include reducing the 150 GWP limits down to GWP 10, as has been suggested for switchgear. 
it's not clear to us why this, you know, all, all the uh, HFC related bands are 150 GWP, which will allow um, new HFO and HFC blends to potentially come into the market when there are natural alternatives available and we can reduce the GWP down to 10. On compliance measures, we see this as an opportunity to create the gold standard approach to tackling illegal trade. And it's, it's clear from the proposal, there's been very significant consideration of this. So we very much welcome um, the improved licensing system, the, the detailed guidance to customs, um, the des designation of specific offices to handle entry and exit of HFCs into and out of the union, um, the consideration of transit within the licensing system and the removal of exemptions and thresholds and so on. Um, also bringing forward the non-party trade provision date ahead of the Kigali schedule is very welcome. Um, and of course, the introduction of uh, harmonized minimum penalties. We still think it can be strengthened further. Um, in particular, we need traceability through the supply chain. An option to require documentation of, of downstream bulk HFC sales, um, which included a certificate of conformity of origin and compliance within the quota system. This option was dropped. Uh, despite support from large F gas producers and importers and, and NGOs, uh, we see the US is enacting HFC supply chain um, traceability from 2025 using QR codes. And we would really like to see something like this in, in Europe. Um, another key issue is transparency. I already know from a quick um, web search which US companies have how much HFC quota under the AIM Act? Why is this still such a top secret in, in Europe in the F-gas regulation? These are dangerous climate destroying gases, transparency improves monitoring and accountability. So we would like to see better transparency. Um, we, we very much welcome the allocation fee, but we feel that it should be more reflective of real carbon prices and and David has obviously gone into some detail about how these funds could be used. Um, finally, our investigations indicate a high prevalence and ongoing demand for illegal HFC 404A, um, which is widely used in refrigeration. And while we understand the rationale for encouraging recycling and reclaim of refrigerants, we think that this should be only for a limited time for these very, very high GWP gases, because otherwise it prolongs dependence on them um, and they will ultimately be emitted. So we would rather see these gases collected and destroyed and not used anymore. And so then finally, just on, on the phase down, um, the PrEP study showed us that it, there is an additional just from, from the scenarios modeled by, by the Commission's consultants, there's an additional 27 million uh, tons of CO2 equivalent emissions that can be avoided by choosing option three over option two. So option three was the maximum feasi uh, feasibility, emission reductions and implementation improvement as opposed to proportionate emission reductions and implementation improvement. And I think that more could be done through early ambitious new bans on HFC and equipment wherever possible, because these will work. Um, without putting too fine a point on it, now does not really seem the time to be proportionate. The recent IPCC port reports are very clear. Every single ton of CO2 equivalent counts and action this decade is critical. So I I've just, the, the chart on the right is from a, a recent paper in Nature Climate Change, the journal Nature Climate Change, which shows the current, um, that the current Kigali Amendment schedule for the global HFC phase down is not consistent with the 1.5 degree Paris Agreement target. 
um, the bottom blue bar is the estimate of emissions in 2050 from the current Kigali uh, schedule. Uh, this is based on the IASA gains model and the orange vertical box indicates this sort of range of HSE emissions they think are consistent with a 1.5 degree target. So you can see how far we need to go on a global level. I believe that an accelerated phase down schedule under the FGAS regulation um, could really help us to meet that target. Um, so we believe that the, the goal should be to strengthen the phase down even further and also to initiate discussions under the Montreal Protocol to accelerate the Kigali Amendment. Thank you, that's it from me. Thanks a lot, uh, Claire. And then um, we are uh, moving on to our last speaker, who we, we already caught a glimpse on uh, earlier. But um, uh, to give a more proper introduction, we will be hearing from Francesco Mastropasca, who is uh, the Institutional Affairs Manager at EPTA and also the president of uh, ASO Gold, and finally chairman uh, in the Eurovent F gas working group. Please, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. Uh, I will now start sharing my screen. And I hope that you can see it right now. Do you? Yes. OK, good. So first of all, thank you very much. And thank you for, for thank the organizers for inviting me to shed a light on commercial refrigeration. and. Uh, it was mentioned before by Claire that uh, commercial refrigeration has been one of the sectors that is practically, we can say, a bit ignored in the revision of the gas regulation, meaning that the, the limits and the thresholds that were applied in the previous gas regulation were maintained in the second one. So there was not a considerable raising of ambition in commercial refrigeration. Uh, let me clarify that although I belong to EPTA and I work for, for EPTA, uh, I try to represent as president of ASOCOL, which is the Italian Association of uh, uh, Equipment Manufacturers for Commercial and Industrial Refrigeration, the Italian Association, uh, which, as you know, Italian companies in commercial refrigeration have a kind of uh, uh, interesting voice because they have a really predominant position uh, in Europe and worldwide. So I think I can contribute to really represent the situation in commercial refrigeration. And I was also recently appointed as a Eurovent FGAS working group chairman. And, uh, and therefore, I, I try to contribute also with my work there. First of all, I'd like to kind of uh, uh, represent here how, what was the impact of the FGAS regulation on our market. The, 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 the FGAS regulation of 2014 has succeeded in changing the market, changing the perspective, and uh, let's say really break the rules. And you can see here a representation of uh, the main solution that is adopted in commercial refrigeration presently and in the last few years. What was the situation in 2015 when the FGAS regulation was adopted? And you can see 5,500 stores with transcritical CO2 and the situation today where we have 40,000 installation supermarkets in Europe working with, with CO2 transcritical. And this is a, really a considerable market share. It's uh, become uh, the standard solution. So when we speak about commercial refrigeration, we shouldn't refer to CO2 and natural refrigerants as alternative refrigerants. I really don't like this because presently the alternative refrigerants are the HFCs that we used in the past. And the similar growth we registered also in self-contained appliances using propane as a refrigerant. So there was a really uh, strong and quick shift to natural refrigerants. And we expect that this is going to, to keep on, to continue, uh, why not? And uh, we have to admit that without the DFGAS regulation, and this is visible where we see the areas, uh, extra European countries, without the DFGAS regulation, we can be sure that uh, the implementation of natural refrigerants wouldn't be 
so quick and so effective. So it is uh, really, we have to recognize the impact of the FCAS regulation was really huge in our market. And uh, in the last 15 years, uh, we have invested a lot uh, to close all the gaps uh, of uh, solutions, implementing natural refrigerants and uh, ultra low GWP systems. The industry has invested and focused a lot in developing new solutions to close all the gaps to achieve a point where the total cost of ownerships of these solutions is absolutely far better than it was with HFCs long ago. You can see examples here. I don't want to enter into any of these technical solutions, but I'd like to mention that we were also able not only to optimize efficiency, but we were able to, uh, let's say, integrate even the cooling and the heating of stores into the main single package uh, power rank, which is, a, which is an achievement that is uh, helping uh, to really boost the efficiency of the global system, of the system seen as a whole. And uh, up to now, with these innovations and these technologies, uh, the market has completely shifted. So what we are required to supply today is only systems like those with natural refrigerant CO2, with propane, and with ultra-low GWP uh, solutions and technologies. This is today the baseline, the standard solution. Having said that, I'd like only to mention one of the recent innovations that uh, I'm not here to present technically, but uh, developments in CO2 are well represented also by this uh, live C4R project which is basically the implementation of the latest and most modern technologies applied to CO2 transcritical to uh, seven pilot stores that have been, uh, of course, uh, observed during the last three years. We have seen potential savings which are quite important, quite remarkable, and that uh, uh, can be considered up to, as you can see, more than 20% of energy saving and uh, modern CO2 systems represented here can uh, even achieve 20% uh, uh, carbon emission savings from cradle to cradle with the LCCP analysis and LCA analysis. Just one example to mention one of many examples of innovations that are currently going on uh, in the market of uh, natural refrigeration systems. So I would stop here and uh, let's say, try to make a kind of gentle provocation. Uh, we know that the majority of companies in commercial refrigeration expect from the F-gas uh, the opportunity to accelerate the, F F the, the phase down of HFCs in order to drive our sector down to near to zero GWP refrigerants. And uh, one of the things that we really try to strongly uh, ask uh, to, to the new F-gas is uh, to align the industry on a sustainable long-term solution, not something that can change a few years after, because uh, we expect that the F-gas regulation has a target to accompany us to cut 98% of the emission of HFC emissions by 2050. So it has to be a long-term act, something that uh, drives the market uh, in the long run. So the bonds uh, which are presently uh, still confirmed in the new proposal for the F-gas regulation are sound a little bit anachronistic because it sounds like we can supply equipment to GWP 2500 up until 2050. This is something we can't imagine. So we believe that uh, we can for sure introduce stricter bands on stationary refrigeration equipment and extend the limit of 150 GWP also to centralized multi-pack systems with the cooling capacity lower than 40 kilowatts. So there is, uh, in our perspective, no real sense to allow the industry to supply to the market steel equipment with 2,500. This is really obsolete. This is 
not reflecting what has happened since 2014 until today. So we think that at least uh, the new F-gas regulation could well align the bans on these products, on the refrigeration stationary equipment to 150, for example, to find an alignment with all the other sectors you see in the picture. Or eventually, the industry is ready also for GWP lower than 10, because there are natural refrigerants, which have GWP CO2 is one and propane is three. There are HFOs, which are also in this, uh, in this uh, GWP range. So we have the solutions and we have the means to uh, shift the market and to accelerate to uh, GWP lower than 10, uh, eventually starting from uh, 2024, which is uh, uh, the first bands we see uh, really changing in the gas regulation. And secondly, second point, uh, uh, looking at the new products, uh, we feel it's definitely not enough, as it was anticipated by Claire before. Uh, there is, we have a problem with the, the market stock of high GWP refrigerants that have been placed in the market so far, and that, as we can see in the picture, are not, doesn't, don't seem to be uh, facing down. So we see that the, the stock of high GWP refrigerants like R404A or R507A, which are refrigerants in the area of GWP 4000, are still widely used in the market, especially for the maintenance of existing systems. So we have a, a fleet of several thousands of stores which are still using these refrigerants, GWP 4000, and that they, of course, uh, generate continuing emissions due to their leakages in operation. 15 to 20% of their uh, charge, their refrigerant charge, is uh, generally leaked, uh, wasted in the atmosphere every year. And it's a refrigerant that has to be refilled in the system and is re-emitted in the atmosphere the year after. So it's something, it's a problem, it's an issue that we have for sure to take with uh, immediate consideration. We see the targets of the F-gas regulation on top in the picture, and we see that we have to cut, it's absolutely advisable to cut 98% the emissions by 2050, but we don't see how this is going to be possible if we continue to use high GWP refrigerants for maintenance as we do today. We have the technologies and the, the refrigerants industry is giving us alternatives to these high GWP refrigerants, which should be supported also introducing a higher ambition also in the area of maintenance, which is extremely important. Uh, what I'm trying to figure out in the picture on the right is that we are kind of sitting on a time bomb. We have this immense amount of GWP, high GWP refrigerants that uh, are, of course, going to be wasted in the atmosphere during the next years. So we have to, of course, take in serious consideration this problem and introduce a reduced limit also for uh, the supply of virgin refrigerants in the market. So we can phase down the, the HFCs also in this area, which is extremely important because for each new supermarket we do today, there are another 20 or 25, which has been done several years ago with uh, obsolete technologies, the technologies of that time and the refrigerants of that time. So I'd like to kind of make a kind of conclusion and uh, deliver a message that in refrigeration, in commercial refrigeration, there has been a huge technological process in the last decade, which can't be ignored, of course. And this uh, progress has been, has been to reduce the emissions of HFCs down to least. And the FCAS regulation should be also the next one, uh, visionary, visionary enough to craft, to describe the market as we wanted in the next years up until 2050. So we are writing the rules that we determine the market changes up until 2050. And we have to consider very carefully that uh, the, the impacts of this over the long run. 
Of course, the DF gas regulation should be reasonable because it has also to consider the state of the art of the present technologies, of course, not be dreamy, but uh, in the right sense, visionary. And uh, should, uh, in our opinion, exploit the potential of all the market ready solutions. So align the industry on sustainable solutions wherever possible, wherever technical solutions are there. And we think, we feel, that the commercial refrigeration sector can offer an important contribution to the environmental targets of Europe. Also, since, let me say, the basket of quotas is the same for refrigeration, for air conditioning, for heating, and we hear that in some cases there are serious doubts or risks that uh, uh, some, some sectors may not, might not be uh, ready enough uh, to to, to, let me say, to uh, support the quota phase down indicated in the, in the SCAS regulation. And we think that if uh, the regulation will, let's say, uh, raise the ambition in the areas as commercial refrigeration where there are technical solutions, maybe this could mitigate the risks associated to other sectors. So why not asking for more where the market or where the industry is ready to give and eventually, of course, mitigate the risks related to, to, other, to other sectors which are less ready to shift to ultra low solutions, ultra low GWP solutions. So, having said that, I, I hope that I was able a little bit to, as I said, shed a light on commercial refrigeration, which is a, an industry ready for a real, a real shift of. of uh, technologies that is shifting. So at yes, gas should uh, at least be uh, ambitious enough, uh, not less ambitious than what the market is still today. So should be at least, at least a little bit visionary and not uh, even uh, uh, be less, less visionary than what the market is today, because we expect a drive from you. Thank you very much for listening and ready for questions, if any. Thanks a lot, uh, Francesco, for that. Um, before we move on to the Q&A, uh, I would just uh, like to hear if Bente has any uh, reaction to uh, what the other panelists have brought up here. Many of them are calling for an even more ambitious uh, FGAS regulation. Um, Specifically, uh, several of them bringing up that the uh, GWP thresholds could be significantly lowered for um, a lot of equipment, for example. Do you have any reactions to this? Um, I mean, uh, it is, of course, the case that the Commission has put out its proposal. Um, so it is uh, what it is, and it will now uh, go to the Council and the European Parliament uh, in uh, negotiation uh, between uh, these institutions. Um, our proposal is, is based on this uh, very thorough and long impact assessment where we have uh, chosen an approach to um, look at the options where we could clearly see that there was a possibility to reduce emissions uh, and at a, a cost which was not, I would say, extremely high. And I think um, most stakeholders will consider our proposal to be very ambitious. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's a matter of, of finding a balance uh, in how, how far it is necessary to go also, I would, I would like to say that um, when it comes to uh, refrigeration, um, we, do, we do have uh, a prohibition in Article 13 uh, to use uh, HFCs or F gases with a DWP above 2,500 uh, for maintenance and uh, servicing. So that would rule out the use of uh, R404A unless it is uh, reclaimed or recycled. Uh, so there are some, some uh, elements uh, also, I mean, uh, Claire mentioned that 
the hermetically sealed uh, heat pumps uh, should not only be prohibited in, in 2027, but in fact, uh, we have changed the, the name for hermetically sealed to self-contained. And um, there actually we have a prohibition already uh, proposed in 2025. So there are some areas where it seems that we are a little bit more ambitious uh, than, than you think uh, we are. Uh, on the points on uh, having a higher revenue uh, using the funding for, for different purposes, um, I think that um, it is in, I mean, it is important to um, be aware of uh, basically what what is the target uh, that we are we are going for uh, with uh, at all, including here a, a quota uh, price. Uh, it is actually not to just raise funding for the sake of it. Uh, it is to um, get um, a disincentive to simply engage in the system uh, for traders that are not real gas, gas traders. When it comes to raising uh, revenue, I would say for the sake of it, uh, that is normally more in the hands of, of member states in the form of, of taxes, which we should not uh, do in an FGAS proposal, because uh, raising harmonized uh, taxes in the EU uh, is something which is very, very difficult to do uh, because it requires unanimity in the council and it would also require a, a different legal basis. So we have to be very careful not, not to go in that alley. Finally, I would like to mention also to that, that what we are actually proposing is that uh, the revenue that we are not uh, going to use to implement the system will go back to the EU budget. That means that uh, when the Commission is making the bill to member states how much they have to pay into the budget, they will have to pay less. Uh, so if member states then choose to instead um, direct some of, of that money uh, into um, implementation or into some incentive schemes, then of course, uh, that's up to them uh, to do that. But I think to get an agreement between member states on how that money should be earmarked will be a very difficult and very, very time consuming exercise that would risk delay, delaying the adoption of the FGAS proposal, even maybe with years. So uh, I would uh, caution against um, being too creative on, on, on that front. Thank you. Thank you, Bente. Um, so uh, we will be moving on to the uh, questions and answers now. And the first uh, question that we will bring up is from Kestutis Kryptis. I hope I pronounced your name uh, well enough. Your mic should be open now, so please. Yes, uh, feel free. yes, thank you, thank you. Just give me a sign that you can hear me well. Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, just a very quick reaction um, to what uh, Madam Tranholm Schwartz uh, just said. Uh, uh, it looks like uh, we are not ambitious enough because we are not brave enough. You said twice during your recent response that uh, on taxes, we cannot reach uh, any agreement uh, uh, because it requires anonymity and even earmarking of funds is a difficult uh, issue. Um, uh, to be um, uh, discussed uh, in the Council. Um, I represent European Economic and Social Committee, uh, and I'm uh, the rapporteur of the um, relevant opinion, which is drawn by our committee in response to the Commission's proposal. We, as a consultative body, 
to the um, uh, European Union institutions, uh, we have this um, uh, duty to provide uh, our opinion coming from the civil society point of view and uh, the ESC combines views from uh, workers, uh, employers and uh, other civil society uh, partners, organizations. I, I represent consumers, uh, for example, I come from small country of the EU, Lithuania, and uh, I'm a member of the committee since 2020. So I, I, I have already um, described my concern in the questions and answers uh, field. I don't know if uh, all the participants can see that, uh, that question formulated, but I would also be, be happy if I could. Uh, Yes, can you please uh, please uh, formulate uh, the question and try to keep it uh, brief so we have time for more questions. Yes, uh, it's great that you can even see me <laughs> now. It it looks like um, so. the 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 idea is to have essentially a system which discourages uh, illegal trading uh, instead of you know creating a, a complicated. Um, um, control mechanism. And if we aim from the very beginning to achieve low um, uh, potential uh, uh, gases uh, used in the system instead of uh, allowing high potential gases, then uh, we have much lower uh, issue with, uh, with the uh, illegal trading uh, later on. Is that correct? And what, what, what would then, uh, uh, what would potentially be uh, a double win is to kill the illegal trading by, uh, you know, encouraging from the very beginning uh, um, bans of uh, high GWP substances. Uh, it's it's probably a, a, a complex question, but we clearly would like to see a holistic approach to this uh, this problem. So I, I guess uh, you, dear uh, Madam Bente. Would, would potentially come back to this uh, to respond. And also I, I'm, um, I'm curious to hear what are other um, uh, analysts thinking about it. Thanks, for, thanks a lot for this. As the, I, I believe this was uh, primarily addressed to you, Bente, so uh, please go. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, um, I would also in this group uh, like to say that we welcome very much that the European Economic and Social Committee has uh, taken it upon them to, to make a, an opinion on the FGAS regulation because it is uh, showing that they have a big interest in, in this area and this is uh, something which is very Im important to us. So uh, first of all, thank you again for, uh, for doing this. Um, it's clear that the less we use um, F gases and HFCs in the EU, the less reason you would have to import F gases illegally. Uh, so there is a possibility uh, to have a win-win uh, situation there. And we are also going that way because we are reducing uh, the need for using these gases with the policies we have. So we are indeed moving in that direction. What appears to, to be the case is that um, quite a, a part of the illegal imports are uh, destined for uh, garages um, uh, servicing um, cars that uh, still use um, the HFC that was allowed to be used in, in new cars until uh, 2017, uh, not under the FGAS regulation, but that is under the mobile air conditioning uh, directive. So when the car park is being shifted uh, with the, over the years, that uh, that problem will also solve itself because there will be fewer and fewer cars actually having HFCs in, in the air conditioning. And th that seems to be an area where, uh, 
where that is, is an issue. As I, I said already for refrigeration, we do have a, a use ban on highly warming uh, HFCs uh, from uh, 2024, uh, where you can still use reclaimed and recycled gases, they then need to be labeled, but you can in principle not use uh, imported gases because they are um, they are always considered virgin when they are imported. So in that sense, um, I would say we are, with the rules we have, um, trying to avoid that there is any need to import these, these gases illegally. But of course, if, if they are imported illegally and they are also used illegally, then um, there's not, um, then, then there's an enforcement uh, issue. Uh, but uh, I would say the, there are bans, they are already in place that is driving uh, this win-win situation. Okay, thank you very much. The, and does any of the other panelists have anything um, to say in response to, to this question? Uh, yes, Claire, please. Thanks. Um, and thanks for the question. I, I think it was just, I just wanted to comment. It was an interesting example from, from Benta um about car air conditioning and the use of uh, hfo 1234yf in place of hfc 134a this actually for us very much demonstrates the problem first of all of drop in refrigerants going from one fluorinated chemical to another um on the chemical gas treadmill that we've been on for so many decades because um, these refrigerants can be easily dropped in. So once a car is, you know, been sold and is in the secondhand market and is being serviced every year and having its air conditioning topped up, it's it's quite possible to top it up with 134A and not with HFO 1234YF. Honestly, I'm not sure which is worse, but one is much worse from a climate perspective. Um, and I think this this does actually <laughs> demonstrate the problem and the need. Um, to have early, full, uh, complete bans on, on F gases in the equipment where we can. Thank you very much. Um, we actually reached the end of our session, but I'm going to try to squeeze one last question in, um, and then we'll see uh, how many can stay online to listen to the answer. I would like to give the floor to Christine Lutzkendorf from uh, do you age? Maybe you can choose one of the questions that you put in the chat and try to keep it brief. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much um, for this. I, can, I hope you can uh, see and clear me, hear me clearly now. Thank you uh, for your input. I would like to address uh, the, my question also to uh, Bente. Thank you for your um, input. I am wondering, you were saying that you changed the definition from the hermetically sealed to self-contained. However, I was unable to find a precise uh, definition about the uh, self-contained and what it means. And I was wondering, uh, particularly for the topic of uh, monoblock heat pumps. So for example, the just the air water heat pumps uh, that will be mostly picked up now, if this point is, uh, if they are included in the point 17 of Annex 4, or if they are not included there is my first question. And my second question, I was wondering why you differentiate between the annexes one, two, and three. Um, because I mean, the difference is of course that uh, some um, chemicals fall for, um, sorry, I'm seeing the word right now. 
uh, fall under obligations and some only fall for reporting. And for example, in the case of substitutes for SF6, um, they are fluoronitrile and fluoroquetone, they are only written down in annexes three and therefore don't fall under the obligations for leakage checks and only reporting, so which would mean that these potentially very dangerous PFAS substitutes could be released into the atmosphere, uh, which I think cannot be acceptable. So I was wondering uh, what your take on this is. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for these questions. Uh, the expression self-contained uh, was introduced actually uh, instead of hermetically sealed systems because we experienced that uh, some companies were trying to circumvent our formulation on hermetically sealed, meaning that they were putting on a valve somewhere on the system, although it wasn't needed simply to be able to say it was not hermetically sealed. And that not only uh, made it escape, escape the prohibition, it also actually made uh, that equipment more leaky. So that's why we have changed the wording to self-contained. We still actually mean what is traditionally hermetically sealed. Uh, so uh, that would then also normally uh, cover these uh, monoblock um, uh, heat pumps, hydronic uh, systems. That's that's at least uh, my my understanding of it. Our um, you can say new invention with Annex One, Two, and Three. Uh, that is, uh, you know, in the current regulation, we have uh, only had. Uh, any form of restrictions related to what we, I would call traditional F gases. And they, they are those that are in NX1. Now we have then separated the HFOs into NX2 and are also requiring leakage uh, containment measures on NX2 gases. So, um, they are subject to both containment and to uh, reporting, whereas NX3 gases are generally only subject to reporting and all gases are, uh, must be included in the training and certification requirements, uh, programs that the member states have, have to set up in, so that we can ensure that there will be enough uh, trained personnel. I think that was a very messy explanation, but I, I hope, hope you got it, you know, that this is why we have, we have divided it into different groups in order to, to target um, uh, basic, better what, what we want to happen with these different groups of, of gases. And the reason why we have included Annex 2 gases under these what we call containment measures, so leakage check. That is indeed a preventive measure uh, awaiting the, uh, you can say, conclusions on the reach, on uh, the faith of HFOs in this PFAS uh, discussion. And we have deliberately not, uh, we did not want to preempt uh, the final analysis and conclusions drawn on the reach on the basis of, I would say, their competence, which is to assess substances from that perspective. Um, we could not, in our impact assessment, uh, make a full-blown analysis on these chemical um, uh, actions, uh, reactions that, that can happen. So. Our regulations are complementing each other. Our regulation is not trying to do um, everything in that respect. Thank you very much. And I am afraid that that will be um, the last questions that we ha will have time for. Um, thank you all very much uh, for participating and for the seven extra minutes 
uh, of your time that we've got. Um, special thanks to our panelists, of course, Bente Tonum Schwartz from DG Klima, Claire Perry from EIA, David Sabatin from EEB, and Francesco Masterpaschia from the EPSA group. Uh, I hope uh, the audience has also um, found some more uh, clarity and learned something new about the uh, EPSGAS proposal. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.